Well, hello. That was too short. Right? That was way too short. I was like, we need more time on that one. I loved that session. Yeah. He's very, like, his voice is so calm. It's so, like, it's, he was a very good moderator. I'm very sad because that, like, the lecture that he's giving for that exhibit that he sent mm-hmm. is the night that we have our details meeting at the venue. Oh, so Otherwise, I was going to suggest that you and I have a date night and go to it. That would be fun. <laughs> would be fun. Well, I can go. Maybe I'll drag the lead there, kicking and screaming. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it go and then we can fill you in on it after that. <laughs> so. Sherry, Sherry. Oh, goodness, you're here. How are you? I'm sorry, I just caught part of that. That's okay. I was just saying, how are you? And I and I I hope maybe we can work together in the future on some of those lessons that you put together. <laughs> Yes, yes, certainly be interested in that. Yeah. I'm doing fine today. I, I, I have been, uh, I found that today's program is, is, I'm always energized by, especially the keynotes um, last night uh, and then this morning. Just wow, just really always a whole lot more to learn. And, and part of me is, as a 30 year teacher, I, I, there, there are things that I wish I had known 30 years ago. Yes. You know, things that I could have applied in the classroom then that I, oh, I know now. So, <laughs> right. Absolutely. Do better, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's been, it's been so good. I'm a little bummed out because one of our colleagues is doing her session at the same time as ours. And she is an excellent speaker, too. So, um, there's a lot of good ones this year. All right. Are we ready to jump in? Are we, what time do we have to start? What? What now? time are we supposed to start? Oh, now? Oh. <laughs> Hi everyone. If you were with us for part one, we're super excited to have you back. If you weren't with us for part one, we're gonna go over our last task that was assigned kind of first here. But first let us introduce ourselves for anyone that might not know us. My name is Kate Bertolet. I am a science teacher and an SEL coordinator at Hamilton Southeastern High School. And I am Wafat Safi, and I am an environmental science teacher and a forensic science teacher at Hamilton Southeastern High School. Kate is my neighbor um, in, in our part of the building. And uh, I am an equity coach in um, our building, and I am also um, the MAC co chair, Minority Affairs Committee co chair. Um, we could talk more about MAC if you have questions later about what we do and what our goals are this year. Okay, so part one focused on the brain. And the, was I taking this slide? I can't remember. I think this is you, my friend. Okay, cool. Um, so <laughs> part one focused on the brain, and we spent some time looking at different parts of the brain and how our amygdala is like our fear center. So anytime we are in a situation that is uncomfortable for us, our amygdala is activated and it physically shuts off communication to the thinking and learning and executive functioning portion of our brain that we call the prefrontal cortex. And one of the things that can make us so uncomfortable is being in a situation that does not fit our cultural norms. So your brains are constantly learning, they're constantly adapting, they're constantly making these connections. And the culture that you are brought up in determines what makes you feel like you're in a normal, recognizable, safe situation and what is unrecognizable and what makes you feel unsafe. And so at the end of the first session, we assigned a task to look at the three levels of culture, surface, shallow, and deep cultures, to start to identify what you feel is normal so that when you're in a situation where you feel uncomfortable and that amygdala might be activated, you recognize that and that gives you a little bit of power and control over the amygdala. You can turn back on the thinking part of your brain and start to make the connections where even though you're uncomfortable now, Hopefully you can get more comfortable in the future. Remember our brains like challenge. They like being stretched. 
So we're going to go back through those different levels of culture real fast and some of the questions you could ask yourself to help identify those levels. And then we would love to hear from you guys if you would like to unmute um, to tell us or if you want to type it in the chat how you identify on some of these different levels and we'll see if we're the same, if we're different, what, how that might affect um, the energy that we bring into our, our spaces. So um, that's our whole purpose here, identifying what we view as normal so that we can identify the strange. Right. So with surface culture, we had a couple of guiding questions. Um, Kate, do you want them to fill out that worksheet or have that ready for them so they can get that one going too, just in case. We have a worksheet that we put together for you where you kind of, we've kind of broken down the three categories, but it's going to help you kind of organize your thoughts. The whole goal again, like Kate was saying, is that we understand where we're coming from because the way we perceive the world, our filters that we have, et cetera, always come out in the classroom. So it's important that we take that, dive, that uh, deep dive into ourselves and do that self-reflection. So this is the worksheet that I was talking about. And um, what we're going to do is have that one available to you. So you can fill it out as you please, um, or just use that for diving a little bit deeper in there. Um, and for the sake of time, we're not gonna be able to get too, too deep into that reflections part, but please, by all means, jump in whenever you can. Um, so let's go back to the surface culture. And these are, again, these are the, the what you can see, the, as we had used the tree analogy, the, the fruit that you, that you see on the tree. So those are questions like, how does your family identify ethnically or racially? Um, where did you live and grow up? So the, the biggest part of your learning, what area was that in? And then as an adult, where were you? Um, did you even leave the suburbs if you were a suburban kid um, or urban, et cetera? What's the story of your family in America? So like my family, I'm first generation, right? Kate's family has been here for generations. And she shared a story about how she got to see her grandmother's signature in one of the books on Ellis Island, which is so cool, right? So what is our story? What's your American story, I guess, is, is the word that I, or the question that I want to pose. How would you describe your family's economic status? you as an adult now has that changed, right? Are you planning, and all of us are teachers here, we're educators, so yes, we've attended college, but were you the first in your family to have attended college? Um, what are some of the stories that you hear regularly in your family? And what are some of your family traditions? What do you do around the holidays? Um, the foods that you eat or some of the rituals that you have? And who are the heroes in your family? Um, who are the anti-heroes in your family? So these are all part of surface culture questions. Shallow culture goes just a little bit deeper. You'll see some cross cutting pieces here, but in shallow culture, we're really looking at metaphors, analogies, parables that you hear from your parents, grandparents, family members. And what do those tell you about your core values as part of your culture? Um, what does respect look like to you? It's going to look different. You know, if I shared a story, we're going to share each other's stories because we swapped slides here. Um, she told a story in the first session about how her mom spanked her and grounded her, sent her to her room for the evening because she dared to call the neighbor by her first name, a neighbor who told her to call her, call, like told Wafa to call her by her first name. She did that in front of her mom and mom was not happy about it. So what does respect look like? And what does disrespect look like? How have you been trained to respond to different emotional displays? Are you comfortable with them? Are you uncomfortable with them? Are they maybe even a sign of disrespect in some cultures? What other attributes are praised in your society and which are you taught to avoid? How are you expected to interact with authority figures? Is respect something that is earned in your book or is it something that you automatically give new people that you are meeting? 
again, do you call adults by their first name or what are some other things that might earn you praises at home or punishments at home? And then we get to the deep culture, which are the roots of, of, of you, your foundation, your family, et cetera. So again, we're, we're looping in back in communication. How did you do school? Um, the self-motivation, what, do we, what does that look like? Or is it effort? Um, you naturally born smart. Um, so how did you come to believe these things, right? What messages do you get about why certain racial or ethnic groups succeed or don't? Um, what did your culture teach you about intelligence? Uh, did you grow up believing that it was a birthright or that it was genetic? Do you know that, you know, do you have the positive stereotypes too? Do you believe that some groups are smarter than others? And just a quick aside, those positive stereotypes do have a negative impact on our students too. Um, but we can come back to this concept again, um, just for the sake of time, um, we're not gonna be able to give too, too much time. So I invite you to take a look at the book, Zaretta Hammond's Culturally Responsive Teaching, It's Culture in the Brain um, by Zaretta Hammond's. And we'll put that up for you in the chat again. Um, it's the first part of this part two of our session. Um, and I would, I invite you, I invite all educators to actually take a look at it and take a look at the same questions that we're posing to you there. We also have some in the end of our session, we can give you um, some additional pieces of information. So as you develop, the whole point here is as you develop a greater sense of your cultural frames of reference, you should begin to have a clearer picture of your cultural self. What drives you? What shapes you, okay? What shaped your worldview? What influences your relationships with others? And so, by doing that, you're going to be able to begin to get a glimpse of your implicit bias through this process. So this slide, as you might be looking at that Google Doc that I shared, um, this slide is just kind of the biggest pieces that you might be able to quickly pull out from those different levels of culture. So again, that document just has some leading statements getting you to reflect a little bit on your beliefs, your practices, your worldviews. And these are some of the things that you could consider as you fill out that document. So do we have anybody here who would like to share um, a little bit about them before we move on? You can either use these statements or maybe answer some of the questions. I'll, I'll share a little. I, I didn't get to go past the surface because I had started actually filling it out in the previous section, but and then I had to go to the next session. But I, I put that I'm black. I grew up. Uh, I live in suburbia, but I grew up in the urban areas in the uh, inner city of Indianapolis. Uh, and my, my family in America, uh, we're descendants of uh, enslaved people. Uh, my mother's people uh, were in Shreveport, Louisiana, and my father's in, in Kentucky. And I'm doing research on them to try, kind of go back, but of course you reach a brick wall after you go so far back. Um, middle income status as far as economics for myself, but I guess growing up, uh, we probably were considered poor. Um, I'm the first college graduate in my family. I'm the only child. I grew up with some cousins, but for my parents' children, I'm, I'm the only one. Um, and um, that's it. Uh, folklore stories. I, I heard different stories about uh, growing up from uh, my mom. My father died when I was four and a half, but in Louisiana and different things that happened uh, to my family that that's, that's as far as I've gotten, but I plan to complete the rest. I think it's a, a really nice chart to engage with. Thank you. That's awesome. And thank you so much for sharing. One of the things that I love so much about these conferences is getting to know other teachers. Oh my gosh, I love it. Um, I'll just, I'll 
share a little bit of my experience as well, unless somebody else wants to cut me off. Um, I have always been in suburbia, grew up in suburbia, moved to suburbia, live in suburbia now. Um, and I, so in the book session, I kind of shared a little bit of my history experience for those that might've been with us. Um, basically it sums up to say that the history of the civil war is taught very differently in Southern states than it is in Northern states. And I moved in the middle of my eighth grade year when we were learning about US history. I moved from Indiana, a Northern state to Kentucky, a Southern state. And the difference was startling. And that really kind of opened my eyes to how we are not all getting equal educations. And it really gave me um, a passion to figure out the truth. And I started teaching in an urban school. I start well, urban-ish. It was Beach Grove, Indiana. Um, I started there at the high school. And then I moved up to HSE. And just the culture shift in switching that school was crazy. Um, but in doing so, I also got to meet so many more people like Wafa, and I got to know so many more of their backstories, and that has just like opened my mind even further. So, if anybody else would care to share Wafa, maybe Don actually has. A, yes, I was just going to say really quick on yours about your comment about your history class. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, I was going to say that now. Do you understand why I got kicked out of those history classes so often? <laughs> Well, I graduated from the same high school in Florence, Kentucky, just 20 years apart. So super small world, but yeah. I'm, 20, I, I'm 27. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, I'm only oh. seven years old, guys. So it's fine. <laughs> so Dawn was actually sharing that she can't unmute um, her, her uh, microphone right now, but she says, I am multiple ethnicities. Um, the strongest part of her culture was from her Spanish grandparents. She grew up in the suburbs and poor, although she never realized it until she was in high school. And religion had affected so much of her experience. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to go out on a limb and Don, correct me. You mean positively, right? Like that's what kept you rooted and gave you the perspective that you needed, correct? To kind of get through life. Please correct me if I'm misspeaking. I think she's typing. So we're going to, oh, I can, I can come back to, to this too, um, if Don can respond, but go on, Kate. All right. So the reason that we kind of did this activity and we focused on us in part one, oh, there's Don. Okay. So she says in some ways, yes, in other ways, it was a conflict. Thank you for correcting me because I really didn't want to go in that direction if I was wrong. Um, dad's family was Protestant. Mom's family is Roman Catholic. It made me very thoughtful about deep issues. Awesome. That is so awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the reason that we kind of did this activity and we hope that you will continue to reflect on this because it can change over time as you expose yourself to more cultures. Uh, is that our brains are constantly learning. And as they learn, we give off different um, body language signals. We give off different energies about the situations that we are in. And because we do that and we are teachers, that energy, those vibes get it translates our implicit biases, our understandings can translate into our classroom instruction. We got into a great conversation in the book study about how textbook companies have kind of permeated this whitewashed view of history into our classrooms. And if we recognize that, then we have the power to change it and to bring different narratives in and to show that and use that equity lens. And we can do the same thing by just being open to hearing about these different cultures, even if they make us a little uncomfortable because they're cultures that our kids want to bring into the classroom as well. So we also spent some time 
talking about different worldviews and different ways of learning. And we're going to use this to kind of put what we've learned so far into action and talk about how we can better our classroom instruction to make students feel more safe, shut off that amygdala, reactivate that prefrontal cortex so that they can think and learn. So one of the biggest differences that we tend to see, especially as we get you know, a mixing of cultures happening is this differing, differing worldview and how we should be learning. Our brains evolutionarily were wired to want to be a part of a community. If you think back hunters and gatherers and nomadic tribes, right, they all had to work together in order to survive. That was just a fact of life as a human. So we have been evolutionarily hardwired for that, but as society has changed over time and we went from more rural to developing cities and developing suburbs, our worldview has kind of changed. And we see this mostly in Western countries. And if you go back to part one of our presentation, there was actually like a score given to a few countries. Again, those that data came from culturally responsive teaching by Zaretta Hammond, but as we've developed these societies and cities and suburbs, we have come to appreciate more individual achievement and independence. One of the things my mom has always told me, especially now that I'm getting ready to get married and maybe start a family of my own, is that you don't raise kids, you raise the adults of the future. And she really, you know, fostered this independent achievement and independence kind of mindset for me. And I know that that's the same in so many students that are, their families have been in Western culture for generations, but that's not all of our students. Right, so we have a good portion of our students that come from a collectivist society. And those societies emphasize relationship and, and interdependence on one another within a community and cooperative learning. Um, one of the things that I grew up with was my mom would say, it's not about you. It's about your family. It's about your community. It's about, so we were never the individual, like in, like in this country and in most European countries, the individual is the unit, right? You are not, you are a part of the greater unit, which is family. So in the collectivist societies, that emphasis is being put on there that you are a part of the whole basically. And that whole is what works together to make everything work for everybody. And we had someone with some great insight in our part one session when we kind of talked about this. And he mentioned that he has noticed that there are several students in his classes that wait for his approval before moving on. And those students tend to be ones that are either first generation here or their families he knows are first generation here. So they're coming from that collectivist background and they're looking for that approval. They're looking to be a partner in learning. And so he was like, wait, maybe I could actually use this and do more group work so they feel that partnership in learning and maybe I'll be able to get a little bit better results out of them. Great breakthrough. I loved that. So, so far in parts one and two, we've looked at how our brains or how our experiences rather shape how our brains respond to situations where if we're safe and comfortable, we can respond. If we're, if we feel unsafe or uncomfortable, we don't recognize something, our amygdala reacts. We aren't responding thoughtfully, we are reacting instead. It also can shape our implicit biases, shapes our worldview, and it shapes the way in which we learn. So we know in our classroom, we're the authority. The teacher is the authority. So you have to ask yourself the question then, the material that we use in our classrooms, what messages are they conveying? Is respect um, a theme that's understood? Is, is something said or is disrespect addressed in the class at the time? Silence is complicity. Who said that? Silence is complicity. Does anybody know? So this was, this was Dr. King, 
And amongst Dr. King's many compelling words, and I don't want to mess up his quote on this one because it's beautiful, but I want to read it for you. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And so what we want to emphasize now is that it is not a time for teachers um, to be silent. It's time now. That silence is complicity. Um, how many times have you heard a kid say something or you heard a kid complain? Well, the teacher was right there. They heard that racist comment that, you know, blah, 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 that so-and-so said to me, and the teacher never said anything. And, and then when you ask sometimes, we, when we have colleagues, we can approach them and be close enough with them. It's like, did you hear them say that? Yeah, but I really didn't know what to say. So it's time for us to move out of that. It's time for us to get those tools together on how to address these situations so our classroom constantly feels safe, right? So what we want to do is take a deep dive or start to show you what a deep dive into the curriculum would look like. And what we, our goal is as teachers is to tease out those implicit biases. We can easily make changes to our lessons um, and we can do that actually without having to do a lot of work at all. Um, it's much easier than we think, but we want to make sure that we are putting those healthy messages out there and that we are having that inclusive classroom. And here is what it would look like. So I don't know like the different kinds of levels we have here. So we wanted to make sure that we included levels for everybody. Um, but one thing that goes across all levels, to the first thing you need to be able to do is address all of your students by their proper name. I was always guilty of at the beginning of lesson or beginning of the school year, I would say, okay, I'm going to call out attendance. And if I butcher your name, I'm so sorry. Now that's not a practice that I continue to do. Instead, I have students introduce themselves to me so they can take a seat in my classroom and I walk around and I introduce myself to them because my last name right now is not super easy to pronounce. So I pronounce that for them, model it. And then I ask them to introduce themselves to me because then I can hear the pronunciation and I don't make them feel uncomfortable by mispronouncing it on day one. That's not going to get, their, their amygdala is gonna be activated. They're not gonna be thinking or learning. So that's just one way that I have changed something small that I do in my classroom to make it feel like a more safe environment for all of my students. Can I just interject real quick, Kate, on this one? Students means have meanings. Um, like my name means loyal. And, and so when you change just a syllable or two in there, the name takes on a completely different meaning in my language. And so when the students see that we really, hey, you know what? You're gonna have to be patient with me, but I'm gonna learn your name the way that your mom and dad says it to you or the way that adult in your life says it to you because it, you wanna show them how important it is to you. And I had a Korean student two years ago her name was difficult. I, I'm usually okay with being able to catch up on in pronunciations quickly, but her name was challenging to me and I kept going and I kept going until I finally got it right. And she said, you're the first American teacher in my whole life that's ever tried to say my name properly. So, and it meant so much to her. You can see that change and her demeanor in my class was different than in other courses in other classes too. So I just want to bring that up. Their name has meaning and those meanings are very beautiful and special too. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> some things that we might not recognize, I know like in the elementary levels, if you have a class party or you have, you know, treats or rewards, there might be some dietary restrictions due to religion. There might be some dietary restrictions due to obviously allergies, right? Like I'm pretty sure peanuts have been outlawed in every classroom in America, but there are other things that we need to be cognizant of. My first year teaching, I did a bulletin board. I taught anatomy and physiology and I was hitting my like five senses. And so my bulletin board, I, I was so proud of, but oh, so clever. It was this elf and the elf I was using all of his senses to talk about all of the different things that we experienced during Christmas and I gave no mention to any other holiday. And now I look back and I'm a little cringy because that was just so blatantly not equitable to all of my students. So being cognizant 
of that, if you're gonna have a classroom party, making sure that it is something that's not just celebrating a subset of your students and their beliefs, but that is open, right? Like make it a holiday party and have students share out their experiences or just have a party because you might have students that don't celebrate holidays. So thinking about that aspect too is just something in your classroom culture that just makes it more inclusive for all. Another piece, um, looking at and including different languages in your classroom. Um, I even have students that are taking Spanish right now and they come in and they're like speaking Spanish. And as long as I recognize enough to know like El Baño is bathroom, like see, sí, you can go. And they think it's so much fun that even though I'm not a Spanish teacher, like they can bring that experience in. There are also really good websites here. So we have readacrossamerica.org that has some great positive characters from all walks of life. And that can be so important. It's so important for kids to recognize that people that look like them, no matter what they look like, no matter what their experiences are, can be successful. We need to break down this whitewash narrative that it is the white people that are successful in society. That law ended, we're done with it, it was repealed, it's unconstitutional, you matter, you are important, you are included in this classroom in all things that we do, including the books that we read. With that, you wanna jump in? Yeah, so with middle school, um, again, proper pronunciation, I and mean, you're gonna see that across all levels. Um, and in junior high, in the um, Indiana history courses that we have, some schools teach it in seventh, some in eighth, um, but how much time is actually truly spent on the indigenous and their plight, what really happened. Um, there's so much in there that really gives us pause. Once we learn this, we can see globally kind of where this is happening and how it's happening, but how many of us actually take the time to, to teach that I've seen a lot of students just kind of glean over that portion of it when it is just so important to the course. Um, clubs and after school activities, um, anti bullying and SEL lessons, the social emotional learning, when done correctly, has such a profound impact on schools. Um, anti bullying lessons, basically um, coming through that and then just addressing things as they happen. Um, again, the readings. Are we making sure that we are showing representation um, through all the, uh, throughout? I teach in a predominantly white school, but I make sure that I try to bring other voices to my classroom so that my white students are definitely benefiting from it as much as my um, student of color in that class whose background it may be. When we take that approach or that mindset, when we expose our kids to all, it broadens their horizons for them even more. And then our classroom decorations um, or our posters that we have up in our classroom. Are we showing representation from all? Kate, are you got high school? Yep. So high school has, I would say even more resources. Um, I don't know if you have ever heard of teaching tolerance. They have been renamed to Learning for Justice. And so we've included some of their classroom, a link to their classroom resources here for you. And there, we're actually in a minute gonna pull out some specific things that we think are cross-cutting topics that you can, if you ever do a lesson on these, it's so, we're gonna model for you um, how easy it can be to get this equitable lens built into your lessons. It's important to know though, once you get to that high school level, like kids are typically, typically, I don't know, I teach freshmen sometimes, I wonder, but they typically are able to handle some of those more advanced, controversial, uncomfortable topics. And so introducing stories and viewpoints from diverse backgrounds, not teaching your majority white students what I was taught in Kentucky, that the Civil War was about states' rights, it's gonna be an uncomfortable conversation about slavery. It's going to be a conversation 
that you will have discomfort and students are going to be uncomfortable, but being with them in that moment and sharing with them and helping them to feel safe discussing these topics is how we're really going to affect change and how we're really able to make and start the changes that we want to see in society with these students. So um, Big History Project is a really good source on that collective learning and getting students in on that um, learning partnership with you to create that classroom culture, looking at every civilization, looking at all of their contributions to see how you could tie some of those viewpoints into whatever level you might be teaching. It might be a little bit more geared toward high school and those uncomfortable topics, but you might, you could still find things that you could build into junior high and the elementary school levels. So, um, is this you or is this me? I can't remember. So with Learning for Justice, they, um, they were also formerly known as Teaching um, for Tolerance. But on their website, they have, for Teaching Tolerance, I apologize. But on their website, they have this whole section where you can dive deep into your curriculum. But they say when we approach a curriculum, we need to look at it with four main goals. And that means we're looking into an anti-bias domain. So we want to break it down into four parts. They actually have within their website, each standard, like standards within identity, diversity, justice, action, what it is. So we want to identify it first, right? So when we identify it, then each child can demonstrate self-awareness, confidence, family pride, have positive social identities. So there are different parts where it breaks it down on how to's, okay? The other thing too in their website, which is amazing, is that they have lessons across the board, grades, subjects, etc. that are all like, okay, so if I'm going to be talking about monarch butterflies, for example, how can I do this lesson using the four goals? Diversity, so each child, the goal here is that each child will express comfort and joy with their human diversity and with human diversity, accurate language for our differences and deep caring human connection. That's the goal for that. Justice, each child will increasingly recognize what unfairness looks like. And we don't stop with just recognizing it. We want to have the language to describe what that unfairness is and to understand how unfairness hurts. And then the action portion, which is so important. And that is where each child will demonstrate empowerment and the skills on how to act with others or alone against prejudice and discriminatory actions that they will come across. So we're gonna take some topics that are probably taught at all different levels and take a look at how you could take this topic and with these four lenses of this anti-bias domain, these four goals, build in a more equitable lens. So the first topic that I'm sure is covered at all levels at different you know, spots and different depths could be a topic as simple as water. If you are an elementary school science teacher, that's fairly easy to build in. Um, there might be a children's book that talks about water as a main component. I'm sure there is. I don't, you might be talking about the ocean. It might be like a book about the ocean and you could talk about water and why it's not okay to drink salt water from the ocean. So we need clean water and then segue that way. But from these different perspectives, we can start to build this lesson out. From the identity perspective, you could have students identify where they get their clean water, or if they've heard of other individuals that don't have the same access. You know, this might be where you tie in a family story. My fiance's um, grandmother still talks to us about how she had to go bring in like six buckets of water a day from the family well because she grew up in the hollers of Kentucky and they didn't have running water. So you could tie in those perspectives because not every kid is going to have the same experience. Yes, they can probably turn on a tap and get water wherever they are, but is access to that water always something that they have? 
last year when we had to close down our water fountains at the school, oh my gosh, it was so difficult at the high school level to make sure that every kid had a water bottle with them and had a space to fill up that water bottle. That was huge. That's something that we could tie in to this lesson now. Looking at the diversity perspective, how do communities other than mine access clean water? So you might go into a lesson on, for instance, I know in more rural parts of Africa, right, there are these missions that build wells to give the people in those communities more reliable access to clean water. Or you could bring in the technology that we're currently developing that will filter unclean water and make clean water. And you could talk to them about how cool that is and how it would be fantastic if this was a resource available to all. Because right now it's not, there's a money issue, there's a shipping issue, there's a location issue for some. Then getting into that justice perspective, what is currently stopping everyone from having access to clean water? what people have that access and what you might boil this down to would be like an economic type thing right having that access but you could start to investigate some of those social or economic or governmental issues that prohibit people from getting clean water or inhibit them from getting it and then to take that action perspective you could with any class at any level do some kind of drive to raise awareness, to raise funds. Awareness would be good if you're in more of an urban area um, that maybe the funds just wouldn't be available because of your student population. Just raising awareness in the community for the things that you do have access to that others still don't. And um, if funds are something that you could do, you could raise funds to buy more of this technology and ship it to those areas or purchase, you know, wells in Af or donate money so that the wells could be dug in those more rural portions. Or it could even be maybe you live or have family or your students have family in an area that is affected by some kind of natural disaster. Um, a hurricane seems like Louisiana gets a lot of those and they're never good. And Texas had a big issue last year and California and the out West is, you know, burning down every year. There's so many of these issues that we could bring and tie back to a water crisis and have our kids develop projects and develop these ways to bring awareness or funds or just to help in any way that they can, these people that are currently or always been disadvantaged. Wafa, did you have anything to add on this one? Yeah, I wanted to add that. So the people, and I don't know how many high school teachers are here, but I have a lot of high school math teachers um, that are in our, in our general vicinity where we are. And I remember when we were first talking about this with the math department, they were beyond frustrated, like, how do we even incorporate this? And so one of the ways that the teacher came up with was, um, she had a student who was talking about, and I, and I also shared my own experience traveling overseas where water gets turned on only twice a week. Well, then what do you do with the other five days of the week? And then we talked about how houses have water pumps with tanks. And so what she did was she turned it into a math problem. After discussing, you know, what some people go through, then she turned it into a math problem. So when the tank turns on and it's supposed to push out this many square feet of water every x amount of minutes and you have a tank that is this big what's the volume that you make it out so she turned it into this amazing math problem but was able to put that identity the diversity justice action lens on there too um, and so there's a lot of ways that you can do this um, and you know in my ap science class ap environmental science class we talk about how some wars were started over water and, you know, it's just, it just expands people's horizons and broadens like, are we take these things for granted? We don't think about it very often. So let's take a, a you know, a look at that and see what it would look like. So um, yeah, that's all I wanted to put in that one. There's a lot you can do with something that looks simple, but you can take it into so many different directions. And then another example would be the monarch butterflies. Um, this is an elementary um, 
one that you're seeing right here is how am I a citizen scientist? So you can define what a citizen scientist is. Then you could talk about how are Mexican and American cultures influenced by monarchs. And this is a great art piece here too. And stories and poems. Um, and then the justice perspective. How do laws help or hurt monarchs? And you can talk about, I think it's Highway 31. It just stops somewhere in Michigan. And there's because there's a zone there that protects, and it's not monarchs, but it's a different kind of, I believe it's a butterfly. But you can talk about those kind of things too. Um, action perspective. What can I do to increase the monarch population? Now I take a look at a lesson like this and I say, this fits my AP environmental science course because we talk about habitat fragmentation and we build structures like walls and build structures like highways, how we literally can cut off species from one another or from the migration patterns that they have. So you can take this so many different directions um, and envelop all different um, backgrounds, the, the science, the social studies, English, all of that. Yes, yes, and Dia de los Muertos, yes, exactly. Exactly, thank you, Alanda, I appreciate it. So, so yeah, go, ahead. go. No, no, you. No. <laughs> So, um, we do have a couple discussion questions. What I want to give you access to before we open up, because we only have like three minutes left, yeah. is if you have a QR scanner or your phone camera, we've put together a document that has resources that you can access to help you get an idea of some of these resources you could bring into your curriculum. And it, um, I know Learning for Justice is on there. It's also in a couple of spots in this presentation. So you can look at some of those and their different levels, their lessons, and some of their ideas that they already have generated for you to get you started. And I think the more that you use these resources and the more you build them in, the more naturally it's going to come to you because neuroplasticity makes that happen. Sorry, I had to build my brain back in there somehow. Okay. <laughs> <It all laughs> so <again. laughs> what? Tying it all together. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, if you want to scan this QR code real quick, if you haven't already, and then we can jump into maybe some of these discussion questions in the last two minutes that we have. Right. And if you feel that we had mentioned something, but it's not there in that document, please let us know. Um, I believe our contact information is in there. Um, and, and just let us know so that we can go ahead and make that change for you and then shoot that, that back out to you. Okay. We're going to lose you in a minute, but these yeah. are some good um, perspective discussion questions. Dominant perspectives that are currently being portrayed in your classroom. Are there others that are missing? Are there perspectives there that are missing? How do you set up your classroom in a way that is similar to or different than what you experienced as a student? Were there things that made you uncomfortable that now you avoid? Um, I see scan didn't work. Can we get access another way? Yes, give me one second. I want to find our list here, culture and the brain. Just in case, drop your email address in here and we can send that out to you too. Yes, and I'm taking a screenshot of everybody that's in this session with us so that we can... Um... Not enough time. <laughs> <laughs> all the awesomeness. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Okay, folks. Sorry, I was late coming back. I just got to do a training, which is kind of fun. Um, since that's supposed to be my job, but during the conference, I'm usually running all over the place. Um, I hope that you at least had an opportunity. I know it wasn't enough time, but I also know what Zoom fatigue feels like. And we also really, I, I just have to give kudos to our professional practices and standards committee. Um, Bianca Tinklenberg is our chair this year and Lindsay Esslinger is the chair of this subcommittee that helps plan the conference. We just knew we wanted to do as much as we could to provide some good information and to be together in the best way we could, but we didn't want to take your entire weekend. 
Um, we did know that the massage therapy and the yoga and the art that we have been sharing with one another at the last few conferences is an important thing. And I know that um, Treasurer Doug Taylor brought up how important self-care is. But I just read something this week that one of my former students who is now a social worker um, at the University of Missouri Health System, um, what Lacey shared, and it's about we need to have we care. It's about all of us, not just taking care of myself, but making sure others around me are taking care of themselves. So yes, self-care is important. It's just like when you're on the airplane, put your oxygen mask on first, but then make sure that everyone else has one <laughs> and has the help and support they need. Um, oh, and I'm so glad Claire was able to join us because she has been very influential, um, active in our planning sessions. So I want to thank all of our presenters who had to turn on a dime from an in-person event to a virtual one. I want to thank all of my colleagues at ISTA who have helped with um, maneuvering a different type of check-in session and all of the um, coordination of recordings. We will work on getting those um, downloaded and be able to share those soon. I have had, I've seen in the chat box some people have been asking about access to materials. So if any of you as presenters, we'll send out another communication as well, but are willing to share your slides or different handouts, please send those to my attention and we will figure out a, a, the best way to be able to share those with those of you who were registered. Um, and as far as PGP points, we will also send, we will have the, the certificate that you were able to fill in for the number of hours that you sat at the computer. <laughs> um, I know that it's not as many points this year, but, and I know we moved it down to three breakouts today instead of four, but we really do want you um, to be able to enjoy, hopefully, a sunny fall day. And I, I just want to thank our sponsors again, our state leadership, because we had um, all of our officers with us at different times. Um, we've had some people from management and more than anything, thank our members. Thank you for registering, for valuing the professionalism and our profession, mm -hmm. um, because we know that we need to, um, to be regulated so we can be calm and helpful um, to all of those others around us, but that we care about doing the best that we can during this very challenging time. Because I have talked to way too many folks who absolutely are so skilled in their craft and they are saying, we thought this year was gonna be normal and it is actually maybe even more challenging than the last two years. And think about our little people. Think about the ones who are in primary school who have never had a full academic year that was normal. Not that any year is totally normal, but you know what I mean. So thank you again to everyone. I think we had some great speakers. I hope you have some ideas for some more in the future for us to check into. And my job is professional development. I know you get way too many um, required things in your school districts, but if there are things that you would like to have for your members, please contact me. We will do what we can. And I think some of our stuff is much better because it's, um, it's developed by you who are still in the trenches. So thank you again. Um, I, I appreciate reading a lot of the different um, notes in the chat box. I absolutely love that Dr. Desitels um, articulated what I have been saying all along. Let's live through the pandemic. We'll deal with learning gaps. Let's live through it. Let's take care of ourselves, our colleagues, our students, our families, and our communities. So thanks again to our sponsors. 
who helped us. And thank you to all of you. Have a great weekend. Our staff supposed to stay on for a bit. Uh, I think just Angela, Joanne, myself, maybe oh. Becky, if she's still here with us. Okay. Um, okay. Yep. Bye. Thanks all for your help. Mm -hmm. Hi, you. everyone. Good job. Thanks. We had tech challenges, but good job. Thank you. And I'm going to start removing folks who.